internet and welcome to the Swirly Cast, the only audio show that can be enjoyed by humans and yokai alike, and is the subject of getting jiggy with things. But uh, let's just pretend that it's related to the context of in this video and the game that we're talking about, and not something else that could potentially be inappropriate. <coughs> Anyways, I am your host, Koma Hobby, so I spent a few minutes out of your day to come hang out. Always much appreciated, every single one of you. And with formalities out of the way, what is on the mind today? Banjul Kazooie. Banjul Kazooie is a game that I have actually wanted to talk about on the channel for a while now, and this was actually at the request of one of my player crowns over on Twitch, Noble Bull. And they requested that I talk about the Baron Briegel and pretty much dominated the N64. And for good reason, too! Banjo-Kazooie is a fantastic game that holds up tremendously today. For those of you who never played it before, this game is a collectathon released in 1998 for the Nintendo 64, and is probably one of the biggest games on the console right after its sequel, which was even bigger. But, you know, hey, it's a really good game, and there's a reason why... So many people hold it in such high regard, even to this day, alongside other great collectathons of its time, like Glover and Spyro the Dragon. But what does make Banjo Kazooie work so well? Well, there's a lot of things that it does, but let's go ahead and start simple with the story. As in, it is very bare bones. The evil wicked witch of Spiral Mountain, Gruntilda, wants to know who the fairest maiden in all the land is. But it turns out that she is not the fairest maiden in all the land. That would be Banjo's sister, Tootie, who is incredibly adorable. And so, in an act of disgust, in order to steal all her beauty away, she kidnaps Tootie and hooks her up to a beauty slot machine. So now it is up to our main duo of Bear and Bird in order to go rescue Banjo's sister. That's all the story you get at the start, and it's, again, it's a platformer story. It's not like the Marios that you would run into at the time, but you know what? For a story like this, I think it works, especially given how amazing Grunty is as an antagonist. There is a reason why people have given a villain archetype name the Gruntilda effect, or Gruntilda theory. Because she is one of the most iconic villains in gaming history. Despite how cheesy she is, she's a wicked witch, not unlike something you would find in The Wizard of Oz. But what makes Grunty work is her attempts to stop you, and where the gameplay comes into play. You see, scattered throughout Grunty's lair, which is the hub world of the game, there are different doors that need notes. How do you get notes? You play stages. How do you get into stages? You need to collect jiggies. And in the stages themselves, there's a lot of things to nab. A lot of them are unimportant, a lot of them are just regular pickups, but most of them are important. Stuff like notes, jinjos, which collecting all of them will grant you a jiggy, and of course, the jiggies themselves. They can be grabbed through either doing simple platforming challenges or by doing a side quest with another character. Pretty simple stuff, and it makes this gameplay loop super addicting where you just grab notes, grab jiggies, go in, go out, there you go, it bobs your uncle, that's the formula for the game. And basically, it's, th th there you go, that's, that's a very simple formula. You go into stages, collect all the jiggies, collect all as many notes as you can, into the next door, and then climb all the way up to Grunty's tower, and then boom, you fight off with Grunty, and then that's the credits roll. Bada bing, bada boom, I just explained the entire story and gameplay loop within a couple of minutes. Aw, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a game from the 90s. It was, it was really expecting something else. This isn't an RPG. Though, granted, this game did start development as an RPG, oddly enough. You see, this was a game that went through several, several design revisions. At once, it was actually an RPG for the Super Nintendo, which later moved on to the N64 disk drive, or the N64 DD, before that flopped so heavily that it didn't even release in Europe and America, and the development had to shift back to the regular N64. And so many of its design elements and music was actually carried over into both of the Banjo games and also Donkey Kong 64. So uh, yeah, this game had a lot of trouble development, but it did see a release in 1998, Alongside other great games like GoldenEye 007, Diddy Kong Racing, Mickey Speedway USA, it's a rare, rare game. Of course it's gonna be top quality. If it's rare to release on the X64, chances are it's gonna be one of the best games of the console. <laughs> Let's be real here. 
And also, there's just so much to do in the game. You unlock moves constantly, with like a whole lot of brand new platforming gimmicks, you meet a whole bunch of different characters with a bunch of different side quests in order to do. Basically, this game is a never-ending gift of charm and happiness. If you were a kid who grew up in the 90s and you played this game, chances are it's one of your favorites because, like, I see so many people talk about how much they love Banjo-Kazooie. In fact, so much so that even despite the fact that Banjo was no longer a second-party thing at Nintendo, both him and Kazooie were allowed to be in Smash! and to have the original Banjo-Kazooie playable on Nintendo Switch through the NSO Expansion Pass. Yes, a Microsoft-owned IP was allowed to be on a Nintendo platform again, which is one of the most special things ever. Granted, this was pretty much just a thing for dire Nintendo fans, but you know what? There's a reason why Banjo was so iconic. And a big part of why Banjo was just so good is because it's music. Oh my god, so good. Composer Grant Kirkhope, I think, deserves all the praise in the world because his tunes in Banjo-Kazooie are some of my favorites that he's ever composed. Some of my obvious favorites are Breezy Z Peak, Treasure Trove Cove, and of course, the iconic Spiral Mountain, which I think may be the best opening level in any video game ever. <laughs> to sum it all up, there's just so much that went into Banjo-Kazooie that I feel is very underappreciated, and also things that would actually go on to be a part of Kazooie, because the game was re-released in 2008 for the Xbox 360 as a part of the Banjo-Kazooie's 10th anniversary. Banjo-Kazooie soon followed after, but we're talking about Kazooie here. So, what exactly did they add in this remaster? Simple, really. A lot. The first really big addition is the addition of widescreen support. It makes the game very playable on modern displays, and yeah, it definitely looks really good on a modern display. And also the addition of true 30 FPS. Sometimes Banjo-Kazooie can get a little choppy at times, especially when there's so much going on. I mean, like, for a game this big, I think it's kind of to be expected. But the frame right now is super consistent and you don't have to worry about frames dropping and inputs not being a thing. The game is very much consistent now. But one of the biggest additions, and something that I'm going to talk to when we eventually get to Banjo 2 is Stop and Swap. This was actually a planned feature in the original releases, but had to be cut. You see, original models of the N64 were originally able to hold bits of data after you remove the cartridges. If you remove the cartridge and then put in Banjo Tooie, supposedly you would be able to get items from Kazooie into Tooie. But unfortunately, later revisions of the model were not able to hold data for more than like a second, and if unless you had lightning fast reflexes, it would make the feature literally impossible. It was a very ingenious way of going about things, but unfortunately, it had to be cut. Thankfully now, with the age of hard drives, if you have a copy of Kazooie and a copy of Tooie, you can use Stop and Swap. And I think it is one of the most special things. They did not need to restore this feature, but I'm so happy they did. Granted, what they did with it in 2A, from what I know, isn't great, but you know what? We'll take what we can get. <laughs> and you want to know the best way to play Banjo-Kazooie today, in my opinion? Rare replay on Xbox One and series consoles. Not only do you get the enhanced versions of Kazooie and Tilly, but you also get so many other games from Rare's catalog. Like, throughout their entire history, not only just on the X64, but also from their days in the ZX Spectrum, and also from their days with modern stuff on the original Xbox. Yeah, you basically get a whole lot of value from it, but of course, you're here for Banjo-Kazooie. Because, yeah, Kazooie is a really, really good game. Again, there is a reason why the game is so iconic to so many fans, both young and old. In fact, I played the game when I was a kid, and I still enjoy it to this day. In fact, it's one of my favorite N64 games. Not my absolute favorite, I would probably go to Mickey Speedway USA, but you know, like competing against a game that good by the same developer, like, yeah, I, I genuinely feel like that's an accomplishment. The writing is absolutely sharp and witty, like, the game can be actually be legitimately funny, I will tell you that much. And it all revolves around the dynamic of Banjo being very kind-hearted and very soft-spoken, to Kazooie just being an absolute brat, and I absolutely dig it, because Kazooie's more jabby approaches to conversations often leads the duo into trouble that they would otherwise avoid if it was just letting Banjo take the lead. 
And you know, there's just so much going. There's an over-the-top villain, there's an absolutely fantastic soundtrack. The gameplay is super addicting, collecting everything, great gaining new moves, heading on to brand new stages. Like, there's a reason why this is one of the most iconic games of the N64 library, and one of the most iconic games that Rareware has ever made. Chances are, if you think Rare, you think Banjo-Kazooie. And that is understandable, because it is one of the most iconic games to come out of them. And honestly, one of the most iconic games in history, I'd say. And while I would like to go through the entire list of things to do, Again, I am on a bit of a time budget, so I think I'm going to cut things here. But before I do, let us hear what our most noble bull has to say. Hey, everybody. Um, my name's Noble. Well, well, Noble Bull, but I actually go by Noble. Um, I'm from the U.S., clearly. Uh, uh, and again, I'm here to talk about Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo-Kazooie, to me, is a game that I can always come back to and find love for it much like Donkey Kong 64. They were very fun games made by Rare, which is no longer a company, sadly. They were bought up by Microsoft. Son of a bit. No. <laughs> Banjo is something I can sit back, relax, and play. It's not something I can see myself just going, oh my god, I need to 100% this right now. But if I feel the need to, I can. For the most part, it's been much more of a sort of relaxed environment whenever I play it. So it's really nice to find a like a platformer that isn't very hard on your body and brain too much. Here's a little interesting fact. I don't know if you said this or not, but Banjo made his debut in Diddy Kong Racing, not actually in Banjo Kazooie, which is really weird. He came out in Diddy Kong Racing before any of the Banjo games came out. I don't know if anyone else knows this, but there is a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie, and it's called Yooka-Laylee. However, I have played that. They are very similar. However, the second game that they made was more based on, like, Donkey Kong Country, which isn't my favorite. Um, but yeah, for the most part, Banjo-Kazooie has been something I just come back to whenever I feel like playing something. It's, it's very much so a have-fun-with-it type of game, not... Not anything you need to sweat swamp, try and play and beat. And for a game that's special to you, I hope I was able to do it justice with today's episode, Noble. I do hope you enjoyed it. And with that, this has been Koma and my friends, fellow viewers, come, uh, what are we so like? Thank you so much for enjoying this episode of the Swirly Cast. Until next time, bye bye! Gah! Ah. Had to squeeze it in somewhere. <laughs> Before we depart our separate ways for today, I wish to give special thanks to the people who support me financially by buying a sub on Twitch or who were gifted a sub. In order of appearance, I'm here to thank Samia Black, Melosony12, Zero Dromus, and of course, Noble Bull. And if you too would like your own Swirly Cats made or would like a shout out at the end of all these videos, then head on over to my Twitch page and buy a sub of any tier. But of course, only if you are willing and able. Thanks for watching!